And uh, Pastor Scott, I want you to know that the message you preached last night is taken hold. Yeah, because um, I made a couple calls to see which of our guys who I called Josh, and uh, he was on his way to come take a look at the boiler, see if he could get it jump started. And before he could arrive, uh, Shannon arrived, and he went down there and and he 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 touched something a certain way, and and boom, it just came on. <laughs> Praise God. So. Uh, See, they're, they're lined up uh, trying to get there first to take care of what needs to be done. Let's give the Lord the praise, shall we? Amen. Praise God. Well, let's stand and open up in prayer today. It's so good to see you here. Thanks for braving the cold temperatures. Don't worry about it. The warming trend is on the way. And hey, we got the fire of God in the house today. Amen. Amen. You feel the love of Jesus in your heart? Just mic on. You feel his love burning in your heart? Oh, that's a very polite amen. I said, do you feel the love of Jesus burning in your heart? Yes. There you go. That's better. Praise God. All right. Amen. Amen. Well, let's worship the Lord. Praise God. My life is in you, Lord, my strength is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. My life is in you, Lord, my strength is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. I'll praise you with all of my life. I will praise you. my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in
my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Let's give the Lord the praise. Hallelujah. He touched my mind. He 
touched my mind. Oh, he saved me just in time. I'm going to praise his name. Each day he's just the same. Come on and praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Well, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. I'm going to praise his name. Each day he's just the same. Come on and praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Let's praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God is real. The Lord is real. Amen. And He is among His people. He inhabits the praises of His people. Amen. You know, when we come to church, we just need to love on Jesus. And just, just turn it loose and let it go and honor Him with our with our testimony, with our words, with our song. Praise God. Amen. You know, we got some prayer requests this morning. We're just going to open up uh, the prayer line. If anybody has any kind of a a need or concern going on, any kind of a battle you're fighting, any kind of an attack that you're under, anything that you're struggling in today, I want you to know that God is able. To do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Amen. Hey, I got a uh, got a praise report here. Uh, last night I sent out a text to the prayer team that uh, they'd taken Tommy, Tommy Horde to the uh, ER. And, um, you know, we've had a concern that, that there might be something deeper going on there with him physically, but uh, the doc said that he's just got bronchitis and and he'll get over it. Amen. And so they sent him back home. And uh, we were were blessed to hear that Joanne Everwine was uh, upgraded from the hospital. She went to Cobblestone for rehab. So that's a step forward. Amen. Hey, he hears and answers prayer. Um, we had uh, Linda DeHaven at the banquet last night and she got word that her husband slipped and fell and broke his leg and so we understand that she had had to leave to uh, to tend to that and uh, also Kathy Brummett is home sick today and we want to remember her in prayer If you're here today and if you've got something going on in your life and you just want God's people to gather around you and stand with you in whatever battle you're fighting, we just invite you to come as we continue to worship the Lord as we prepare to pray together for one another. Amen. My foes are many. They rise against me. But I will hold my ground. I will not fear the war. I will not fear the storm. My help is on the way. My help is on the way. Oh, my God, he will not delay. My refuge is free.
In him I live and move, and we have our being in him. You know, when you figure that out, that God is real, 
and the reality of God can manifest in your life personally, that you can know Him and have relationship with Him. That's the beginning of transformation in your life. That turns things, everything right side up. When you give God the glory, we give Him our worship, and then He gives back to us that presence that sustains us in the journey of life, meets our every need, resolves our every issue, helps us to put everything in perspective. We see the big picture when you put God first. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, we got, got a lot of people that are facing uh, difficult times. Pandora's got a uh, diagnosis of some cancer in her esophagus. Donna found out she's got some cancer in her lung. And it's just a little bit, but still, you know, it's, it's there. And uh, Russ is having a new knee put in. Crazy, some new hardware. March 12th, I think he said. And uh, I forget all. But, you know, when you're, Pastor Scott, when you're praying for people, you, you just hear all the details there. Yeah. And I want to tell you, life is not easy. But God is good. Amen. 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 Those are two of my favorite words in the scriptures. But God. Amen. <laughs> Things look pretty bleak. Things look pretty dark. But God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. As long as you got God in the picture, as long as you have him in the center, you're going to find out that you're not as anxious and you're not as fearful yes. as you were before. Amen. You're going to feel the comfort to know that that he's got you, he's holding you, taking care of you. Amen. Well, praise God. Before you're seated today, just confirm your love to somebody in your neighborhood there, behind you or in front of you. Just tell them, hey, God loves you and I love you too and I'm thankful for you. Thanks for being you. Amen. Praise God. We're going to have our ushers come today as we continue to worship the Lord through our giving. We're so blessed to have Pastor Scott and Tandy here with us today. Looking forward to today's ministry. Thank you, everybody, for your sharing the vision for our church. Do we have any ushers today? Where are they? Here they come. Okay. I thought I saw you guys earlier. Praise God. Amen. It's good to have Dave back home. Amen. He's going to bless us while we give. Praise God. Gary, would you lead out in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day, God, that we can come into your house and worship you, Lord. And we just love you, Lord, and we thank you so much for the many blessings that we have in your ways that have blessed our church. God, we just pray that you would bless that gift to give her, Lord, multiply these monies for the upbuilding of your kingdom. And we ask it in your precious name. sins and griefs to pay and what a privilege to carry everything and 
Savior still our refuge take it to the Lord in prayer do thy friends despise forsake Thank you, Dave. Hey, you know that that old hymn is is timeless. Never get tired of hearing that one. That's a fantastic message. Thank you so much. Praise God. It's great to have Dave with us today. Um, let's see, where's is Kent uh, in here? Oh, there he is. Okay. Yeah, we got a couple of clipboards to circulate. Um, our Scott and Tandy, our, our church um, has kind of a nickname. We're the Church of the Clipboard. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah, don't want to get, get off on the wrong foot here today. <laughs> what, what clipboards we got there? We got two today. Two, okay. We, which one are you going to talk Valentine about? Valentine Day Night. Date night. Valentine Date Night. I'm going to talk Whew. about the chili cook off. Real okay. Quick. My goodness, there's a bunch of, bunch of uh, dates yeah, going on. Looks there. like it. Yeah, I'll keep it uh, short and sweet. Uh, I know after last night's message from Pastor Scott, you don't want to listen to me. So we're ready to hear what God's laid on his heart for the church today. So, But we want to talk about the chili cook-off. So we've done this, I don't even know how many years now. I think probably eight years, probably something like that. Is it ten? Okay. But we've done this. So it's an annual cook, chili cook-off. Most of you know how it works. Um, several. We've got like 17 people signed up now to bring in a chili. A pot of chili. So we go through, you come in, you get your raffle ticket, you test all the chilies, go back, get as much as you want. There's sandwiches usually. And then you go up and you vote for your favorite chili. And then at the end of the night, we announce the top three. So um, this is a donation based um, uh, deal. So when you come in the door, you just donate whatever you can, whatever you have. And this goes towards Royal Rangers and the Missionettes. So we do campouts. We do uh, pine, pine wood derby for the boys. We, uh, the girls are always doing stuff. So this money goes towards to support that. 
And, you know, we want these kids to uh, learn about God and what he has for them. At the same time, we get to go outdoors and, and enjoy what God has provided for us, you know, and take these kids out. And uh, so we just ask that uh, if you are interested, uh, go ahead and sign up. We got 17 chilies. Uh, that's probably the max. Um, so um, I'm not going to compete this year since we have that many because the pans that we have, they can only hold like 15 little test cups. So <laughs> we're already past that max. But what I'm going to do, I'm just going to bring a pot of chili, and that way we got enough for everybody to eat. So there's going to be plenty there. Um, so, but we do ask if you are bringing a pot of chili, uh, try to make sure there is enough there because I think we're going to have a pretty good turnout this year, it sounds like. So just make sure there's enough in there to get tested um, and then have a plenty left over for someone to eat. So if you can, bring in a pot and do it that way. And then it looks like we, there's still a couple spots on here for sign-ups for like desserts and stuff like that. So we'll pass this around and we appreciate the support for the girls and the boys. Um, it, it, it really helps out a lot. So thank you. Kent, before you are seated there, I just want to, <clears throat> just want to share something with the congregation about about those chilies. Um, now, what we don't want to have happen here is have like eight or nine people say, "Well, they got too many chilies." Yeah, we don't want that. So bring. Right. We got seven. We got so, twenty or thirty. We're going to improvise. We'll figure that out. If you got to come yeah. back up and test again, so we'll so that so out. we're we're not saying if you <laughs> signed up to bring a chili, you don't have to bring it after all. Okay. Nope. That's yeah. not what I'm saying. Right. But uh, yeah. yeah, I've if learned by experience, one, Pastor Scott, happen. Scott, and uh, we'll and Tandy. I'm not. Maybe you've experienced this too. That sometimes what people hear, they uh, they kind of uh, uh, hear it different yeah. than what you yeah, intended heard to be heard. That, but, hey, yeah. That's what I said. Uh, yeah. But so that's I, not what I meant. Just wanted Bring to a chili. just wanted to clarify that if you signed up for a chili, that's your that's your spiritual gift. Yeah. God has given you that ability. And that talent, and it needs to be exercised. Yeah. So let's bring those chilies and yeah. enjoy those chilies to the glory of God. And it is, uh, it is very a labor-intensive project that we put. It does take a lot of people. So if you're willing to volunteer and do the, the serving, that would be fantastic. Also. Please, God. Uh, That means we're, we're having fried bread, too? There's fried bread, and there's peanut butter sandwiches. Salad, oh, my goodness. So, yeah. You should wow. go home hungry. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a big deal. I'm getting hungry already. Thank you, Kent, so much. Appreciate your leading the way on that. Amen. also want to encourage you to continue your prayers for Pastor Phoebe as she recovers from her surgery. And um, she's had, had a few difficult days here recently, but uh, I believe overall she's making progress. Amen. And I know she's listening this morning. Pastor Scott, come. Hey, we. how many enjoyed getting acquainted with this wonderful couple last night? Amen. Amen. We had a, had a glorious time at the, uh, what was that, the Appreciation Banquet. Yeah, we had a terrific time, and thank you so much for sharing your heart, and we're looking forward to the message today. And um, Thanks for bringing Tandy with you. Absolutely. And hey, I'm going to pass Absolutely. the baton. All right, we'll do it. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate you so much. You and Marsha are, are great friends. We've known each other for a long time. 20, 23 years ago, I started pastoring, and about a year or two in, I became a ministry group presbyter. And I don't know how long you served as a ministry group presbyter, but we were on that board a long time together and often sat next to each other uh, over the years. And so I've just so appreciated you and your leadership and your friendship. And to be able to come is a real blessing for Tandy and I. So just thank you. And thank you to all of you who came out last night for the banquet and then were brave enough to come back today to get round two of what we shared last night. I've got a different type of message to share with you today. And if you have brought your Bibles, you can open up to the book of Luke chapter 15. I will primarily be in that passage, the first seven verses throughout this morning, uh, or you can pull it up on your, uh, on your mobile device or laptop or whatever it is that you brought to look at the Word of God in today. 
I'll be reading this morning out of the New Living Translation, so if yours doesn't completely line up, don't worry. I'm not preaching blasphemy. It's just a different translation of Scripture that I'll be reading out of. But the Word of God declares this in Luke 15, and I'm just going to read the first two verses to get started today. It says, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. Father, we ask today in the name of Jesus that you show up in a mighty way. Father, we thank you, God, that it says, Father, that that your spirit comes to bring us truth. And so we give ear to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to the church today. Lord, I know that when your word goes forth, it does, it accomplishes all that you will and desire it to. It never returns void. And so, Lord, we're claiming that today, that the word of God that is about to be released in this house will not return void, but it will reap a harvest of righteousness in the hearts, lives, and minds of everyone who hears it, both here and online, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You know, the company, if you read this passage of Scripture, is really interesting. The company that surrounded Jesus was really a mixed crowd. I mean, on one end of the spectrum, you had the religious elite that were following him, uh, uh, the businessmen and business people that were curious. And then like on the other end of the spectrum, you had tax collectors and prostitutes. And, and when you stop to think about it for just a moment, you know, the company that he kept, why did he, why did he, you know, because most of the time, you know, a lot of times people want to focus in on a group. And I'm going to focus in on the suburban families, or I'm going to focus on, on, the, on the urban uh, type of ministry. You know, a lot of times we, we try to categorize, but Jesus, he had broad appeal. And the reason that he had such broad appeal is simply this, that Jesus came and to seek and save the lost. Not a certain economic class, not a certain social class, not a certain religious or political class. He just came to seek and save those who were lost. It was Jesus' association with these tax collectors and and sinners, however, that kind of set the context for probably one of the greatest parables that we read in Scripture. And it's one of many that Jesus uses to communicate the kingdom of God. Jesus loved parables. Parables, if you read it in the Cambridge Dictionary, is just a simple short story that communicates a moral or religious truth. A very simple story that communicates a truth. And that type of storytelling had broad appeal. From the religious elite all the way down to tax collectors, they all enjoyed hearing and experiencing that kind of teaching. He would use these parables, though, to shake up the commonly accepted ideas and practices that often held communities in shackles. You know, this parable is really no exception. You know, if you stop to think about it, society often wants to consign people into groups, whether by gender or ethnicity, religion or nationality, But what Jesus does is he uses this parable to dispel that idea and differentiates mankind into just two categories, lost and found. That's it. It wasn't about race. It wasn't about color. It wasn't about gender. It wasn't about status. It was simply this. You're either lost or you're found. And this was kind of a revolutionary idea. Because it broke down the caste system that molded the society that they were in. And it pulled people into a a new set of norms, so to speak. You see, a caste system was just a way of separating people by wealth or by name or by religion. And Jesus said, we're not going to do it like that. We're going to separate people based on two categories. You either are lost or you're found. That's it. So when you stop to think about this, so Jesus told them a story. And you can look here in verses 3 and 4. He told them a story. He said, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? 
I think what's important to note when you read this scripture is there's just one sheepfold in the story. Just one. All the sheep are part of the same fold. This was kind of a revolutionary idea as well because the Jews consider, consider themselves exclusively the people of God. And so for him to say that all of these people are part of our fold had to ruffle some feathers, so to speak. In their minds, they were the only sheep in the fold. Now later in John 10, 16, Jesus would challenge that idea with them. And he would say this. He would say, I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. So he was, he was really just breaking down all of these. He, he broke down their caste system and said there's no hierarchy of people. There's only two categories lost and found. He was breaking down this, this idea that Jews were exclusively the people of God. He says, no, there's others out there. There's other sheep that are a part of our fold. And so this parable, just in the first four verses, he is messing with them. I mean, they don't know what to think as they're listening to this. Now, if you were the tax collectors and the sinners, if you were a foreigner in the group, you're probably thinking, amen. But if you were a Pharisee or a member of the Sanhedrin, you were thinking, you're preaching blasphemy. And so Jesus begins to lay this out for them. What we learn in the parable of the 99 is this. If you're going to write something down, write this down. What separates the sheep is not a matter of identity, but proximity. That's what separates the sheep. You say, well, what do you mean by that? The fold is not divided by race or ethnicity or gender or nationality or even social strata. It is divided only by its proximity to the shepherd. That's what divides it. You see, one sheep is lost. Why? Because it's separated from the shepherd while the others remain securely in the fold. No explanation, though, is given to why the sheep wandered from the fold. <laughs> and I believe that because, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's because sheep are dumb. Well, it doesn't say that in Scripture, even though it may be true. I don't know. I've never raised any sheep, so I couldn't tell you. But the idea is this. There's sometimes, I think, that, that God leaves specific information out because he doesn't want us to extrapolate it and build our own ideas around something. Because there are a lot of reasons why sheep wander. Think about it for just a minute. What are, what are some of the variety of reasons why a person would wander from God? Well, maybe because they prayed for someone and God didn't answer the prayer the way they wanted and so they wander from God because they're dejected and disappointed that God didn't answer the way that he thought they thought that he would. Maybe they were rejected by church members. Uh-oh. Maybe they suffered tremendous church hurt and it actually drove them away from God because of what they experienced from the other sheep. Somebody once told me that you need to be careful if you're going to be a shepherd because sheep bite. I was like, I didn't know sheep bit until I became a pastor. And then I found that out. They do bite. Amen. Amen. That's right. Maybe it's because they were unable to reconcile the trauma they've experienced with the goodness of God. You ever had anybody struggle with that? How could God allow me to go through this? Why would God allow them to go through? They can't, they can't reconcile and so they wander away from God. Maybe it's simply as simple as this. They were just drawn back into sin. So there's many reasons why a sheep may wander, but I thought it's also likely that it is left unanswered because let's face it, as believers in our carnal nature, we would spend more time focusing on the conditions surrounding their lostness rather than focusing on the value of the soul that was lost. See, we have a tendency as humans, we want to focus on if he would have said, this is the reason the sheep wandered, that would be all we would spend our time talking and thinking about. What caused that person to wander from the shepherd? What caused that person to end up lost? We would focus on their lostness and not focus on the value of the soul that wandered away. That's just us. 
You see, this parable communicates the tremendous value that God places on a human soul. He doesn't focus on why the sheep is lost. How many of us having a hundred pennies, if we lost one, would stop what we were doing to find that one penny? I would say likely not many of us in this room would tear our houses apart looking for that penny. And why is that? Because we do not place much value on a penny. The fact that Jesus left the 99 to go and search for the one lost sheep gives us insight into how God sees us and the links that he will go to to bring us home. Sheep have a tendency to wander without considering the dangers and consequences that being separated from the shepherd can cause. Being shepherd, there, there, there's risk involved from wandering from God. There's risks involved from wandering away from the one who has committed himself to love you and protect you and to care for you. But fortunately for, for some of us sheep who are a little thicker headed, I like the people who giggle because they identify with me. Fortunately for us, God understands the gravity of being lost far better than we do. And he pursues us into the wilderness to bring us home safely. Yes. The goal is to bring his family back together. That's the goal. In fact, if you look in Luke 15, verses 5 through 6, it says, And when he was found, when, and, and when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I brought something with me today. I wonder how many of you have ever been to a restaurant or to a school or maybe even in this church. You've got a lost and found. Right? And it, what, what I find interesting about a lost and found items, right, that you go to is that when you say, I need to see, do you have a lost and found? When they come out, they only come out with one box. They don't come out with a lost box and show you what's in there and then come out with a found box and show you what's in there. They just come out with one box. One box. Lost and found. Now, it, now we didn't have a lost and found box at our church. We had a lost and found shelf in the back coat room. Where we would put things. And I, I know Pastor Sam. This, you guys. You may be able to identify with this. I was always shocked. By the things that I would find. On the lost and found box. You know. Some of these are just very uh, common. We would find. Cups. That people left. We would find. Uh, we'd find. People would leave their reading glasses. There, you know, common all the time, jackets. They just leave them, leave them there. I, I don't understand one shoe, though. <laughs> one shoe. You came with two, you went with one. I don't understand that at all the time, unless it's a toddler. We had one lady, I'm not lying, notoriously left her entire purse at church. Oh, yeah, so I, we actually, I told her I'm going to talk about you in church this morning because my wife's taking a picture to show her. Every Sunday I would go to the back room and, or back row and there would be her purse sitting there with everything in it. The one that really got me all the time was we had to have a stack of 15 Bibles sitting up on that. I would ask my people, what are you reading all week long? Because your Bible is sitting on the back, on, the, on top of that. And people said, well, we have more Bibles at home. I was like, you take that up with Jesus. <laughs> we, have, we, even, we couldn't fit a person in the box, but we even had a lady leave a kid at church one time. Drove off. I mean, was going down the road. My wife had to call her and say, hey, uh, how you doing? Oh, good. Uh, I was wondering, are you missing anything? Uh, don't think so. Do you have all your children? And we could see her in our mind's eye look into her rearview mirror and go, Oh my goodness. And back she came. 
to pick up one of her four children that she had left at church. You know, you, you think, Pastor Scott, why do you bring this up? Because there is no such thing as a lost and found box. Because everything in that box is lost. Everything is lost until someone comes looking for it. And only once it's secured by its rightful owner is it truly a found item. Did you hear me? That all of the things, there was no found items in this box. You say, well, somebody found it, but not the rightful owner. Only when the rightful owner comes and finds it and takes it home is it a found item. So you are either lost or you are found. If you've not been found, if you say to yourself, I don't think I've been found, then you ain't been found. Because you'll know when your rightful owner has found you and claimed you and taken you home to be one of his. You'll know that you've been found. You see, it's easy in our human nature to be critical regarding those who have wandered. In the story of the prodigal son, how many of you are familiar with the prodigal son story? It's it's later in Luke 15. You can read it for yourself lately. I'll summarize it very quickly for you. There was a man who had great wealth. He had two sons. One of his sons, the younger, demanded his portion of the wealth. He took it. He wandered off from home. He squandered all of his wealth. There was a famine that came and he squandered his wealth. He was destitute. He was working for a pig farmer. He was eating slaves. Slop out of the out of the pig pen, and it says that he came to his senses. Some of you got some children; you need to pray that prayer over God. Let them come to their senses. Some of you need to pray that over yourself. You come to your senses, and he says, "I'm going to go home to my father. I'm going to repent. I'm going to tell him I'm not even worthy to be his son because his hired hands eat better than I'm eating. I'm just going to go home and be a hired hand." And so he makes, it, he makes his way home and it says that his father sees him a long way off, which is a whole sermon in itself, but it says he ran to meet him and he kissed him and he dressed him. He put him on a robe, he put a signet ring, he put sandals on his feet and he says, it's time to rejoice because my son who is lost has now been found. The father declared in Luke 15, 31 through 32, he says, look, dear son, You have always, and he's talking to the younger brother because not everybody was excited about him coming home. The the older brother was not happy that the younger brother was able to go off and to do what he did and come back and be celebrated. And so here's the father says to the, the older brother, he says, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead And has come back to life. He was lost. But now he is found. Can I tell you what the real tragedy is? The real tragedy is not that people are lost. It is that found people have lost the value of a human soul. That's the real tragedy. The tragedy is not. I mean it is tragic that people are lost. But the real tragedy is that those of us who have been found. Those of us who have been snatched from the flames. Those of us who who the shepherd came and and found us and, and, and discovered us and brought us home back to the fold. We have lost the value of a human soul. How do you respond when the wayward sheep come home? Do you find yourself reacting more like the father or the older brother? You know, how many of you have ever had to look through a lost and found box for something. For real. Or in the show hand. Anybody ever have to go look in a lost and found box for something? I mean, there's a few people in the room. You've had to go and look for it, through it. Did you find what you were looking for? No? Some heads shaking no. You know, here, this is an interesting thing. If you did find what you were looking for, how would you react? Would you rejoice Or would you say, oh, I can't believe I found it. No, you wouldn't look with disdain and say, look at this lost thing. I lost this and now I find it. I couldn't be more sickened by finding this thing in the lost box. 
You know, that's not how we would react. We would react, we would rejoice and say, I have been looking for this shoe. And I'd have a lot of questions for you. But you would rejoice over the fact because of this. And this is why it's so important. Why would you rejoice? Because you found something you valued that had gotten lost. That's why you would rejoice. You went looking for it. You had to hear me. You went looking for it because you valued it. You didn't just sit in your home and think, I hope somebody finds my shoe and brings it back to me. I hope somebody finds my Bible and brings it back to me. You know, it's funny how many times people would call the church and say, Hey, Pastor, I think I left this or something there. Would you mind looking for it for me? Now, I was a good pastor. And I said, Sure. And I looked around. Well, or I sent my wife (laughs) to look for it. Usually she already knew where it was. Because she cleaned up the sanctuary and put it on the, on the shelf in the back. But that's usually what I, I would just simply go back to the shelf and look. And I would say, oh, I don't see it on there. Or, yes, I do. But in my mind, what, it, what that told me was is that wasn't va- even valuable enough for you to come back and find. But you want me to find it. Oh, now, you're amen in a lot, but I'm about to turn the tables on you. Because when we start thinking about winning souls... And you sit in your pew and say, Pastor, that's your job. It's your job to go and look and find the lost people, the hurting people. But they're your people too. If you don't value them enough to get out of your pew to go find them, you shouldn't expect him to get out of his pew and go find them. Or your next pastor. Why? Because we've got to value the lost ourselves. We've got to value them ourselves. It says here, In verse 7 of Luke 15, it says, In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. There is more joy, it says, in heaven over one sinner that repents and turns to God than over 99 others that have never strayed away. My question is, do you pursue those who are lost in your community? Are you going to look for the lost? And my question is, why not? Do we not value them enough to bother looking? You know, I, when I look into a church, and your guys' church is pretty full this morning. Praise God for that, seeing as it's like sub-80 outside. It's horrible. But the idea is that every one of these, pew, every one of these seats in these pews represents a soul. In the kingdom of God. And why aren't, we, why aren't we more passionate about finding who it is that's supposed to sit there? Who is it supposed to sit right here? Who is it, it is supposed to be sitting right here? Who's supposed to be sitting right here? I can just go all, all the way up and down. The, who's supposed to be sitting next to you today? And if we think to ourselves, well, the lost will find their way here. Listen, the lost do not find their way. They get found. They get found by people who value them enough to pursue them, enough to go after them, enough to, to reach out to them, to pray for them, to invite them, to share the gospel with them. They get found whenever found people begin to value the lost. That's how they get found. That's when they begin to see the church filled. You know, there was a commentary I was reading about lost, the lost sheep. And I just thought it was fitting to read it because it's not original with me, but it is so good. It'll make you stop to think for just a moment. Challenge yourself as you read this how you would react. It says, we might consider the shepherd leaving the 99 to find the one this way. A father and his five children are asleep in their home when the smoke detectors go off. The father awakens to find his house filled with smoke and the sound of flames and crackling timber coming near. Panicked, he races to his children's rooms and begins to rouse uh, rouse them. 
Calling to some and carrying others, he stumbles down the stairs and out the front door. He deposits the sleepy children on the gra grass a safe distance away, and then he turns, gasping for air. He squints through the smoke to count his kids. Tim, Sally, Angela, Jojo, where's Lily? He is missing the youngest, three-year-old Lily. Four children are safe, one is not. What will the father do? He says, God is a father. He counts his kids. He rejoices that some are safely in Christ, prepared for eternity, and nestled near his heart. But some are missing. Where's Karen? Where's Abdul? Where's Jose? The father sent Jesus on a rescue mission to seek and save the lost. He does not abandon the 99. They are already safe in his kingdom, attended by his angels and guided by his Holy Spirit. But his heart aches for those who are not yet in the fold. Wow. I mean, what about you? How would you have responded in that situation? I mean, I don't think any of us in our right mind would sit there and go, well, I got four of the five. Right? Would we not rush back in to save the one? Why? Because he valued that soul. And it's found people. We need to value the souls that are lost. Listen, I understand that you all value and love each other. Because you spend time together in a flock like this, you grow closer together. But the mission was not, Jesus wasn't trying to create a flock. He was trying to rescue his children. That's why he came. We need to place value on the lost. Now, I have lost things before that I did not bother going back to look for. <laughs> I mean, anybody else in the room? Have you ever lost something and you're like, yeah, I ain't going back. You leave a glove, you know, you leave a hat someplace, you know, something like that, you know. And I'm notorious sometimes for leaving things. So it's, things I know that I lose, I don't buy expensive ones of. Sunglasses, you know, they, no way. I mean, you're getting a $3 pair from the Dollar General store because you're going to lose those. And there's no, but I can tell you that if I had a, a $300 pair of glasses, probably going back to look for those. But the three dollars, why? But why didn't I not go back and bother to look for them? Because I didn't value them enough to go back. You see, we all talk a good talk about how important the soul is. But how many of us are moved to go and search for them? If it's valuable enough, you will try and find it. If it's valuable enough. If the soul of your neighbor, but Pastor Scott, he is horrible. He's loud, he's obnoxious, he doesn't treat me nice. Until you learn to value the soul of a person, you'll never even try to go and find them. See, we all want to we, we try to find people who aren't so lost, Right? I mean, if they are wandering right outside the church door, I'll go after that one. But who's going into the pits of hell? Who's raiding the doors, of the, the gates of hell for people who are that close? I mean, who is, who is going out? Who values souls enough that I'm willing to do what it takes to go as deep as I can into a person's life to see, to see that they are brought back in to the fold? We've got to value souls. And not just talk the talk, but we need to walk the walk. Does that mean you're going to face rejection? You better believe it. Sheep bite. There was a reason that shepherds carried staffs. But sometimes they had to bonk some sheep on the head. They did. They had, a, they had a hook. Because sometimes they got into places they needed help getting out of. But those places make us uncomfortable. Well, I don't like being in places that people are having a hard time getting out. It makes me uncomfortable, but that's where the sheep are. That's where the lost souls are. But they're doing things that are getting them in trouble, and if, they're, if I'm seen with them, then I'm going to get in trouble. Welcome to Jesus' world. The religious elite, I can tell you that if there are folks who are sitting in church that are, that are talking negative about you because you're trying to reach people who are lost, you are not the problem. You're not the problem. You're doing what Jesus would have done. Jesus went after the lost. He went into the highways and the byways and he compelled them to come in. That's where Jesus was. Now, did he love the Pharisees and Sadducees? Sure he did. 
Did he call him broads of vipers sometimes? Yeah, he did that too. You know, he, 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 but he, but he understood the value of a soul. He wanted to see Nicodemus one just as much as he wanted to see Mary one. He was desperate to see his children back in the fold. You know, bringing sinners home, and I'll, I'll bring this to a close. Bringing sinners home is Jesus' mission. Let me tell you what Jesus didn't do. Jesus didn't bring us into his fold to keep us corralled. <laughs> Think, I want you to think about this for just a minute. We are, this is, the church is not a holding tank waiting on Jesus to come back. He didn't just plop us in here and say, stay. And go back out to look for more. That's not the way, that's not what the church is in any way. His mission is our mission. As believers, our job is not to manage the fold. Now that is a word from the Lord from somebody in here. Because somebody, so there may be some people that think you think that is your job. When pastor's not around, it's my job to manage all these sheep. Okay, good luck with that. Our job is not to manage the fold. But I can tell you, Pastor Sam, with all honesty, as a pastor, we probably, unfortunately, spend more of our time trying to manage the sheep that are in the fold. And, and because we spend all of our time doing that, we don't get out and actually reach the lost ones that Jesus wants us to reach. Amen. So this is, this is just weird because it's free. And, and, and Pastor Sam is getting ready to retire, so he doesn't have to worry about it, what I say next here. <laughs> He said, come on, amen, say it. I've been probably wanting to say it for 20 years. The, <laughs> if the sheep in the fold would behave themselves and get on mission with the shepherd, there would be more lost people being found. That's just, just that's simple. That wasn't too bad, was it? That's good. But you need to behave yourselves. Just the, the sheep in the fold need to behave themselves. Don't bite each other. Don't, listen, there are no head sheep in the sheepfold. There's no head sheep. We learned last night, you're all filled with the Spirit. And so you need to behave like it. You need to live like it. You need to say, okay, the mission of Jesus is what? To seek and save the lost. What are we all doing? Sitting in here every week. And nobody new showing up. We're not bringing anybody with us. I can tell you the only reason we don't bring people with us is we don't value people enough to go after them. We don't. You'll say, well, I've, I've asked this one person a thousand times. Then ask somebody else. Because if you're focusing all of your attention on one person a thousand times, how many thousands of people have you missed inviting and talking to because you're only focused on one person? Get out there. You know, one of the things that I love, I told you I was closing, so I better do that. What time did you say I had till? 1.30? No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> one, of the, one of the greatest examples is, you guys, you know, there's uh, those dandelions that grow in your yard, pesky dandelions. When they're in that, when they're in that white phase, not when they're yellow and, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of pretty, but, you know, they're still a weed. But when they're in that white phase, that's all, those are all seeds, Right? And, and the, the thing that you, as a, as a person that loves to take care of his yard, hates the most is when the wind blows. And you see all the seeds come off. And you know what your yard's going to look like next week. But when you think about evangelism, evangelism is simply this, is that, is that it's, like the, it's like the breath of God. And, and those seeds go where they are, where they may. I just tell you this, share the gospel wherever you're at, with whoever you're with. Invite people, just, just, and then God will make certain that they plant where they need to plant. They may not all plant in this church. Some of them will. There'll be a harvest. I can guarantee you this. If you're all out there sharing the gospel, inviting people to church, there may be some people. I had a friend of mine that invited me to his church a dozen times. I ended up at a different church, and I got saved. Now, you can, see, you, you can say, well, that was, that, that's not how we want to see this happen. Is it not? Are we more concerned about the church or the kingdom? We want to see the kingdom built. And so we want to share the gospel, share the gospel, blow on those seeds of the word into people's lives, invite them to church, pursue them, pursue them. 
You know, I can tell you that, that whenever I met my wife, that, that immediately I was attracted to her and I pursued her. She appreciated that. 31 years later, right? But I can guarantee you if I'd have seen her the first time and I said, you're really pretty, and I'd have went home and said, I hope she finds me. <laughs> I would be single, Scott Burr here, Sharon, at your meeting today. <laughs> The idea was is that what made that relationship work was there is a hunger in my heart to pursue her. And so if we can get a hunger in our heart to pursue souls and to understand sometimes we're going to get bit, sometimes it's going to get difficult, they're going to say no a lot. But the more of us that are sharing and pursuing, the faster that these empty spots that represent souls will fill. They'll fill. Let me close with this last statement, and then we'll pray. The believer's job is not to manage the fold, but to reach the lost and rejoice with the shepherd who is still bringing home the lost sheep. I saw a meme on Facebook not that long ago, and it said this. It says, I thought leaving the 99 to go after the one was crazy until I was the one. Right? Seems crazy. Seems crazy. You know, why would we, why would we want to, we, this is a great church, why would we want to go in and bring people in that we don't know? I mean, we all get along, but we brought some, a whole lot of people start coming in, that could be a problem. I remember hearing testimonies from churches that started bus ministries, and, and, and they started bringing hundreds of kids in on Sunday morning to, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they all weren't from the right parts of town, and some of the church people got upset. Because of it. I mean, no, that can't be the heart. It can't be the heart. We don't know who God's going to sit next to you, but I do know this, that if if they get born again and get saved and you don't like it, you're probably going to have to sit in heaven by them for all eternity. (laughs) That ain't Bible. That's just me guessing. That's just me guessing. Amen. So would you just stand with me real quick all around this room? I just want you to bow your heads for just a moment. And I just want to ask this question, you know, first of all. Maybe sometimes, maybe you've been coming to church. Maybe this is your first time today, I don't know. But you're seated in here with the 99, but you still feel like you're the lost one. When I said earlier that when you've been found, you know you've been found by the shepherd. Maybe today you'd say, Pastor Scott, I don't feel found. I've never really repented of my sins. I've never really fully given myself to Jesus, the shepherd of my soul. But today, I've heard your message, and I, and I desperately, I desperately want to give my life to Christ. I want to be, I don't want to leave here lost. I want to leave here found today. If that's you, just right where you're at, would you just slip your hand up and say, pray for me? I don't want anyone to leave. I see your hand in the back. Thank you, young man. I see your hand. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate that. Can we just pray together as a church? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, for those that raise their hands. And Father, I want to encourage them. As soon as we're done praying, I want to encourage you to come and find Pastor Sam and Marcia so that they can pray with you. You say, well, that's, it's scary That's to, to come and to, to make a profession of faith like that. But can I encourage you, that's how the lost get found. Is that you're going to meet Jesus today in a way you've never met him before. And you're not going to leave here feeling like the lost sheep. But you're going to fe- leave here feeling as part of the fold. You're going to leave here found. Doesn't matter if you're, if you're 10 years old or 50 years old or 80 years old. Or whatever. But if you will put your, your life into the hands of Jesus... Your shepherd, you're going to leave here transformed. So would everybody pray this prayer with me, especially those that raised their hand. Say this with me. Jesus, thank you for coming to look for me. You found me broken and hurting and lost. But your heart is to bring me home. I repent of my sins. And I give my life to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father.
Now, Lord, I just want to pray for the rest of you today. And I mean, as soon as I finish, I do, if the two of you that raised your hand would come, we want to pray with you. We want to make sure you leave here strengthened and you feel found and loved before you leave. But I want to pray for the rest of us in the room today, the 99, that you have a mission to accomplish. And as long as there is an empty seat in this church, then you have souls that need pursued. You say, well, what happens, Pastor, if we fill every seat? Are we done? No, you go two services. And then you fill it again. So, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus right now. This is what I pray for this congregation. I pray, God, that you would help them once again to value souls enough to pursue them. I pray that you would give, I pray that you would give them the courage. But, Lord, I pray that you would help them to value souls again. That the found people would understand that the lost people are valuable to Jesus and that we need to pursue them and go after them because God loves them so much. And so, Lord, I just pray today as this congregation, as they leave this place, they are already going to be thinking about the folks that they're going to pursue. Relentlessly pursue because they desire to see them brought back into the family of God. Father, we ask all this today. In Jesus' name, and the church declares, amen and amen. God bless. Can we give the Lord a hand clap today, amen, for what he's done? Thank you, Pastor Sam. As he closes, I do want to encourage you that raised your hand. Please come find us. Let us pray for you before you leave today. Praise God. Boy, I know why they call you Scott Burr. Because you're like a burr under the saddle. <laughs> Did you hear that? You know, when I was a kid, I had a pony, and we'd put a saddle on that pony. Yeah, come on down. We'd put a saddle on that pony, and if there was a, a burr or a rock or a pebble or something under that saddle, that, that pony would get agitated. And I want to say thank you, Pastor Scott, for bringing that message, because that's a message we needed to hear today. Because if, if you're a human being like me, I know I tend to get comfortable with the status quo. And sometimes we need someone to come along and, and just put a burr under our saddle and make us a little uncomfortable with how we're following Jesus. And if there's some things that we're forgetting and leaving out of our daily experience, our duty before God as an ambassador for Christ. We need someone to come along and make us feel uncomfortable. And that, uh, that is so true because um, um, to be a spiritual leader, it's not about only about comforting the afflicted, it's about afflicting the comfortable. And I, I hope you feel a little bit afflicted today <laughs> because I do. You reminded us of some valuable truth here today as to why we're here. How many got the message? All right. That's about 50%. Got arthritis in the shoulder? How many got the message today? Amen. Amen. Lord, help us to not only hear the message, but to internalize the message and to go out into this world and sow the seed and let our light shine for you and to do what you have called us to do. And Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless your people, Lord. Go with us and help us to stay on course. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Pastor Scott and, and uh, Tandy for coming to help us out. And uh, God bless everybody.